the Lord. Father in heaven, we uh, just want to recognize what an awesome God that you really are. And we thank you so much for allowing us to know you in a personal way through your word. And we uh, especially thank you for the opportunity we have to be part of a, a, a biblically right thinking church, one that exalts your name and exalts your word. We, uh, uh, we just uh, want to dedicate this time as we go through the vision statement that has been placed out here for by Tom for Hope Bible Church uh, is expounded on it and help us to uh, to get uh, to understand it better to um, help uh, to foster that as we go forward. Um, help me as I present it and the good words uh, in my mouth. We ask your blessings on this time, Father, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And a, a wonderful time specifically of Thanksgiving as we approach the season. What, a, what an unusual Thanksgiving season for our country it seems to be, for me in my lifetime anyhow, where um, potentially some people are going to be worrying about knocks on the door <laughs> to meet people in the house or whatever. It just seems really odd. Um, and I sure pray that this, uh, this season of uh, difficulty we're going through will be um, over with um, and uh, we will be profited by it. So, and I see somebody on there, looks like Sasan, is that right? Or is that uh, Rachel? Looks like Rachel. Rebecca, excuse me, Rebecca, I say Rebecca, I'm not sure. Is that Rebecca? Sasan and Rebecca, you guys saw that uh, Sasan engaged last week. So that is his, his um, betrothed in their engagement party. Okay, um, I'm going to begin. We left off last time. Um, we had talked about the exemplary church and ex expositional church and exalting church. This being in the vision statement that uh, Tom Leake put together for Hope Bible Church. The importance of the vision statement uh, is kind of interesting to talk about because um, churches kind of get started and they go along and we all have the one vision, which is um, worshiping the Lord. Um, that's what we're going to do as a church. Um, and coming together, uh, as Hebrews says, to do that regularly. Um, and that's, that's a vision statement. That's kind of a broad vision statement. But when it comes down to it, there's lots of uh, different ways of doing that, lots of different ways in which the body of Christ comes together uh, and what it can do, what, what's its purpose in the world. Um, you can remember, um, I guess when the, the woman poured the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, um, one of the disciples was, Jesus was talking about how that was a waste of money. It could have been spent for the poor. And he says, the poor you'll have with me, with you always. Um, was Christ saying, don't go ahead and minister to the poor? Not exactly. Um, but there's there's lots of things that churches get into and sometimes get a little skew um, from their moorings and from their starts. Um, and hence, we talked about some of the, even the, um, the mainline churches as they were begun um, in their inception, uh, in the Reformation and thereafter. Um, they They had some dedicated people with some Ideas, all people seem to have sort of the central kind of ideas together. They work together. And then as time went on, generation after generation, that gets lost, um, gets changed, gets modified, gets compromised to where they become even apostate. Um, so having a vision statement from our founding pastor uh, is really quite important for Hope Bible Church to maintain uh, uh, the, uh, the direction and the moorings that we're going for the church, which way we're, we're headed and for guidance really for generations in the future. So hopefully this document would be something that would be used um, for uh, future generations at Hope. But we here presently um, can also get um, benefit and be on the same page, um, working together as it will, pushing it the same direction um, it's on the wheel and, uh, and so forth. So our energies are, are um, uh, increased and, and, and focused better. So last time we talked about the church 
um, most importantly, being exemplary, um, that um, uh, what we stand for and what we do, um, how we do that. There's a, a question um, always in there's form and there's function in a church. Um, function in the church really doesn't change. Form does from culture to culture, from era to era. Uh, you may change the form in which you do something. Um, so this document talks a lot about some of the form uh, of what we do, but also in relation to the function of the church. Function is more the fact that we are here as a body of Christ to exalt Christ uh, and to um, uh, bring the gospel to the world and make disciples. So um, the I think we left off last time after talking about the exemplary church and expositorial church expositional message, messaging and teaching, uh, an exalting church, exalting our Lord and Savior. Um, next, we are going to move on to an equipping church. So if anyone is with me on the thing there, um, going back to the top, Tom has a sort of summary definition. I'm going to read it to you here, and then we'll go over it on. Um, an equipping church, he says, is we uh, endeavor to instruct, disciple, and train our members and families to live obediently to Christ, for Christ, and to stir up their spiritual gifts and dedic in dedicated service to their master. Only as every member of the body of Christ is trained and active in loving service does the body function in a healthy, dynamic manner, causing the growth of the body into maturity. Spiritual equipping is accomplished by biblical quali biblically qualified, divinely called, and congregationally affirmed men who instruct the congregation through expository preaching, doctrinal teaching, biblical counseling, personal discipleship, and leadership development. These little summations that Tom puts in here are really quite packed with a lot of uh, meaning, a lot of um, structure and so forth. And so he unpacks them as he uh, opens up what he's talking about more fully. But, you know, more fully, he says, our, our commitment at Hope Bible Church is to mature each believer by informing him or her of the full teachings of Christ, the whole counsel of God, so that each believer understands the logic and the reasonableness of Scripture, Acts a knowledgeable and educated faith is able to stand up to the wiles of the devil and false arguments against the Christian faith. First Peter 3.15, as we know, says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, but with gentleness and respect. The church has an important ministry to itself, to build itself up in love. Romans 14, Thessalonians 5, and I also would think you know, Ephesians 1. This, this is um, in the uh, discipleship component of Hope, Bi uh, Hope Bible Church ministry. We have always desired to take believers who come to us and move them through a path of maturity and greater Christ-likeness. HBC has a strong commitment to this task. It has been a regular testimony of newcomers that they were not being well-fed or taught in their previous churches, and that they came to HBC to learn how to live in a manner pleasing to the Lord, Colossians 1. This is also uh, one of the hallmarks of our church. And I guess, I don't know how many of you I mean, the Hope Bible Church have felt that way, but I know being in the visitor ministry, um, that's often a complaint that I hear and people are researching us online are looking for a church that has some real solid, um, you know, challenging teaching that uh, moves them forward, maturing them. In order to have a strong discipleship ministry, we maintain a high view of scripture. And we talked about that earlier with an exalting church. Scripture is primarily means of our sanctification that the spirit uses, that God uses. 
We hold convictions concerning the sole authority of the Bible over all areas of Christian doctrine and practice. No human counsel speaks for God, only scripture. So some of you that come out of the Catholic faith, you know, you have the Pope, you have the Magisterium, other uh, churches have their hierarchy and synods and whatever else. The only thing that speaks for God is God, his counsel. Um, we defend this high view of scripture because we have a high view of God. Scripture is the voice of God who never errs, has all wisdom, and is perfect in all his attributes. Another important component to establishing strong churches to uh, identify the men God is raising to be elders, pastors in the church. The local church, as it mature, needs a plurality of elders who bring wisdom to bear on a number of vital issues in the church will face. And we talked about elder role and the reason why plurality is important and so forth. Multiple elders give stability and a biblical wisdom to each issue as it is encountered. Elders must be well-qualified and mature men of faith who can humbly listen to each other, learn from each other, guide the church in spiritual beneficial ways. They are to be men um, who are affirmed by the entire congregation as ready to lead. And then they are appointed to be elders um, to their office of shepherding. This doesn't mean that the congregation elects elders necessarily, as we talked about with Hope Bible Church. Um, but there is a time frame when things are put out. And you'll see someone is being uh, appointed as an elder or a deacon the congregation gets a um, opportunity to give input to the elders for that so they may consider it. It doesn't necessarily mean they will not or do whatever the congregation votes on. These elders are to, are, are to support the senior pastor's leadership in the vision of the church. This is an important thought process and one that has not always been the case at Hope and been a cause of us kind of slow progress. Um, there are some who would disagree uh, that there should be a senior pastor. And some of those have landed at Hope Bible Church and given uh, argument to that, that case um, and not recognizing. We talked about that when we talked about the leadership of the church and, and so forth and the reasons why there is uh, in general a leader uh, amongst the elders that will, will guide and so forth as a pastor who has a, uh, a vision and such, and they should move together in that, that thing. It doesn't mean that anyone's more important than others. It means people have different roles on the elder board as well. Join him in, uh, they join him in establishing and advancing it and uh, provide biblical balance to carry out uh, that vision by providing their own insights and concern. In this way, the church is well-balanced and not driven by one man. Biblical eldership is crucial to the health of the local church. And the church languishes under poor leadership. Leaders who are not qualified to lead, leaders with ill motives, leadership by only one man and with leadership that is at odds with their lead pastor. So you can think about how that, this is an organizational structure having infighting or something like that, or somebody who's not recognizing a leader, um, supporting a leader and so forth, can be a, a drag on the church. Now, of course, the, the, the one leader, the senior elder of all is Jesus Christ. So we all serve him. So we're all under shepherds that, that, that serve as elders in the church. But there in a local congregation, there needs to be some direction in there always seems to be one that picks it up. You can see that pattern even in Jerusalem where, where James would have been at the council in Jerusalem looking to be the senior pastor. There's times where you see um, Peter certainly taking on that role and so forth in, in church history. We also believe that God has given us enough teaching and wisdom in scripture to solve our counseling problems and effectively navigate all ministries of the church. 
we believe in the sufficiency of scripture for salvation in Christian living. Psalm uh, 119. We do not turn to psychology in an attempt to understand man to solve problems. We believe that is the role of God's word. God's word properly understood and rightly applied is what each soul needs. Very important part, particularly in our culture and society that turns to um, uh, quote unquote science, uh, the science of psychology, uh, the science of medicine, for solving many of things that are, that are simply sin. Um, and the Bible has the answer for those things. It is the remedy for those things. Um, not a pill, not a, uh, a good feeling psychological talk or, or so forth. So in, in that case, that's a very important statement. Again, these are, these are some of the, uh, the form, um, uh, function taking form. So believing in the fact that sufficiency of scripture is very important. A lot of churches say that. How do they actually apply it? Um, what, what form do they do? So this is going a little bit further and fleshing that out. Um, this dedication to thinking biblically and applying scripture manifests our desire to be good and careful disciples of Christ. In keeping with those beliefs, we dedicate ourselves to the use of scripture in our own lives, applying scripture meditating on scripture, memorizing scripture, and conforming our lives to internalizing all the commands and precepts, Joshua 1.8 and Psalm 1. So also this manifests itself in discipleship. Discipleship in post-Pentecost era occurs in the context of the local church, not primarily by a strategy of one-on-one -on -one discipleship, though at the present and the past of overall design. Okay, so there has been a time, you know, you're thinking about this one-on-one -on -one discipleship where you, you can think of Aristotle and, and, and Pluto and others and so forth as these philosophers would disciple one another. This is not the design. Um, it, is the, uh, it is Christ's design, the entire body used the very gifts of the spirit to minister to itself. And again, thinking again of what we just studied about the gifts of the spirit and thinking of the, the body building itself up using that thing, the dynamic body causes the growth of the whole church, Ephesians 4, 16. Within the dynamic body, the more mature members help the less mature members to learn to pattern their lives after Christ, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, Titus and two. In this way, there is room for one-on-one -on -one and small group discipleship as well. Building up the body of Christ also involves a dedication to teach the counsel and counsel each disciple so that they may grow in godliness. And you know, if you're, you're following along, uh, Hope is uh, currently working and becoming a counseling center, but there's more to counseling than just having a formal center. It is our desire and vision to have a full biblical counseling center to minister to the needs of our members and unleash uh, gifts re, um, related to counseling and discipleships. So this was written before um, Gabe had begun establishing that, but that was part of our vision to do it and we will be doing it. But as we saw before, counseling also takes place one-on-one -on -one, and everyone is part of that team, even if you're not formally in it. We counsel one and all to each other each every day. Teaching is also a large part of discipleship within the dynamic body. Each teaching event, whether a, in classroom, small group, or large setting, involves the uh, impartation of divine knowledge and wisdom from Scripture, and if believed and put into action, results in increased discipleship. Second Timothy. These. Uh, this is one reason we are dedicated to hosting Bible conferences for the uh, for they contribute greatly to the discipleship process since they provide a prolonged exposure to the Word of God and gifted teacher. Leadership development also is specialized form of discipleship. Much leadership development is supposed to 
occur in regular assemblies of believers as they worship and learn, 2 Timothy 2. In other words, Sunday at church are part of leadership development. In addition to this specialized instruction, help develop leaders, prepare them for humble servant-like leadership. The shepherding uh, ministry of the elders cons uh, is consistent. They, they feed the sheep, guard them from false teachers, oversee the flock, success in uh, uh, discipleship, and the health of the body depends on proper trained, well-motivated men watching over the flock in 1 Peter. So going Sunday morning and hearing of expositional message is all part of that in the uh, equipping church. The family is, is also ordained of God. And we take our task seriously to help each member of the family live in obedience to God in Christian home. God expects fathers to leave their home with servant like love, Ephesians 5. Wives are to submit to the real authority of their husbands as the Lord, trusting the Lord to direct their husbands, Ephesians 5.22. Parents are the primary ones confirmed, commanded by the Lord to bring up their children in the teaching and training of the Lord, Ephesians 6. And how that plays out, by the way, in our culture is an interesting thing you might want to talk about. All right? They are to teach the, 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 uh, the word at home to their children, disciple them, love them, pray for them, help them learn to mature through their years. The church joins the parents in this holy task, not to replace them, but to add to their holy influence with the full giftedness of the body of Christ, Ephesians 6.1. Our vision for the future is to continue to see a church and home work together to raise up the next generation of godly Christians and workers. I'd like to stop here just a moment. It's set near and dear to my heart. Um, probably should be for all. Think of how this applies in in, in actuality. Um, just the just the, the thing here where it says that uh, the God expects fathers to leave their homes and 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 to be the the, the one that they teach um, and disciple and so forth and love their children. How does that work out with a culture that we have? And, and in what areas are we talking about? Are we talking just about the Bible, the book? Is that where we're supposed to teach them? Or is, it, is there other things that that would be inclusive of? Probably have a friend to question all that succinctly. Uh, are we talking general life principles or are we getting into the subject of uh, the breaking down of the family in the American culture? Because <laughs> uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, as you know, there's across American culture, uh, uh, the, the, the term single mother gets used a lot. You usually don't hear single father too often because um, the, the courts favor uh, giving custody to the, the the child to the mother i don't know that you were getting into that uh. yeah i think all that kind of comes into it i'm thinking of the statement here that tom makes parents are the primary ones commanded by the lord to bring up their children in the teaching and training of the lord so where does the teaching the training of the lord take you if you think about it i mean there's people that say well that's sunday school okay and uh, that's that's devotions at home. That's dealing with the, we'll read the Bible, we'll talk about the Bible stories that are in there, and we'll talk about, you know, uh, what Jesus did and what the commands are, and, you know, we'll teach all those things at home. But does that have anything to do with anything else? I mean, where do the kids learn? Where, where are kids taught these days? Uh, well, most most people, uh, parents ship their uh, kids off to, to the, the public schools. <laughs> yeah, so, I, don't, uh, I, I don't want to be pejorative about thinking ship them off because there's a lot of reasons why that has developed and makes sense to people. The concept, however, is who's, who's most responsible. When we see kids going awry, 
um, and doing uh, things. Um, I hear it a lot. Parents say, I can't control my kids. They're going haywire and this and that. I remember, I remember my brothers would constantly say this. I had uh, Ron, I had brothers that had kids before I did, and they were, always were, you know, years ahead in in their development of their children. And uh, they would constantly tell me, says, "Oh, just you wait. The next couple of years, you'll see when they have all these problems and so forth." They were sending them to uh, Montessori schools and other things, and I was doing homeschooling. Not that I'm going to say homeschooling is the only way, because it's not, but I was getting a lot of rash for being homeschooling, saying I was limiting my children and, and not uh, teaching them what real world is about and so forth. Um, and I was kept constantly getting this every thing about just wait two years, wait two. I'm still waiting two years, by the way, for the for the things that they were talking about that I was supposed to see in my kids. Not that they're they're perfect and not that they haven't made mistakes, but we taught um, giving this, taking this command here, took it seriously on every subject, um, not just the subject of, you know, Jesus uh, was born, lived, died, and rose from the dead and saved from our sin, but the subjects of, of, of science and geology and uh, medicine and history and mathematics and whatever else. Um, and, and we took that seriously, said that we're the ones commanded from a biblical perspective to, to do that. Now, you can do that, people do do that within the guides of sending their kids to public school. Um, so it's not like those, you, you can't do that and be following God's commandment. But the, but the statement here is one we have in our vision is that we hold that strongly that parents are the ones primarily commanded by the law, Lord. It's not, well, I couldn't really control it. My kids, the school system made all that problem and so forth. No, it's your, it's your, your problem. You're the one commanded to do it. Um, well, pardon me, Colin. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, I mean, I just, that just occurs to me there too. And, and sometimes I get maybe too passionate about that. So, forgive me if I offended anybody in that regard because I don't mean to. But wherever children are educated, whether they be in our colleges these days, which we see a lot of raising this being taught in college, it's still, you're paying for it. Uh, the, the parents are the ones that are, I think, uh, commanded by God to doing it. And that means doing it in a biblical manner. In particular, the church joins the family um, in discipling youth of the church as they get increasingly ready to uh, transition from under their parents' authority to the authority uh, and guidance of the church. Uh, in our vision for the youth ministry, it remains committed to coming alongside of parents by teaching the youth how to live for Christ. It is also our vision to expand our youth ministry to reach youths who do not have Christian parents. The youth ministry also is there to foster Christian friendships, learning events, and opportunity to learn to serve uh, God in the church. It may may be surprising to some that there in the beginning of the church there was quite a, I think somewhat of a disagreement whether or not we shouldn't even have a youth ministry um, because again going to the previous statement the parents are primary in command uh, bringing up their children and teaching them the Lord one could make a you know go all the way to the other side and say wait a minute um, that's not the business of the church that's my business I'll, that they should be done that parents should do that teach parents to do that. And so there was an argument to that, that the youth ministry shouldn't really even exist. Okay, any thoughts on that, guys? It's a definitely an argument that can be uh, understood. Um, yes. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think maybe uh, uh, elders of the church and uh, members of the church realize, as you've stated, there are some youth that don't have Christian parents. Um, uh, also, I will say that, you know, having like uh, the children's ministry during the worship service allows the, the parents uh, for the younger ones to be able to participate in worship and, and, and fully concentrate on worship um, during that time period. So it's not meant to be a, uh, a, uh, in place of it's, you know, supplementing and, and, and benefits uh, the church as a whole, I, I feel. Yeah. I'd like to, I'm glad you brought that up too, because, um, 
you know, one of the um, first few years of the church when we were meeting in Laurel in a small little thing over there, people would come with children that um, were used to going to children's church or going off to Sunday school and were not used to sitting for a 50 minute expositional message. Um, and when they came and they saw children in our church that did sit front row taking notes out, taking small children, taking notes, um, they would often look and say, nah, this isn't the church for us to hear. Our kids will never do this, okay? Uh, and in that vein, this is one of the things of, um, of different form. The function is the same as you're talking about, of you know, teaching the children, but taking a form that meets the culture. Um, and in our culture, it was children weren't being taught to be as um, still, if you will, um, and uh, attentive in those kind of circumstances and needed to have something that would uh, attract their attention more. And hence the children's ministry grew and grew because of it. It, um, it is still the response to the parent and it is not at all um, something that displeases um, or should displease the leadership of Hope Bible Church that children would be in worship as opposed to in children's ministry. Um, if they are, you know, taking notes, they're getting something out of it, and you say, what can a six-year-old do in taking notes? Trust me, they can, and they get to be great note takers, but not all can, and, and so there is, um, there are these functions. This is the body of different parts, different things, and the children's ministry becomes part of that to service the entire body. So you'll see some families who have their kids sitting in, in church, um, and they, they're doing it. That's the way they're teaching, and that's the way they're training, and it works. Um, but in order to have uh, an orderly church worship service and not have screaming kids flying about the room, um, the parents, uh, having a children's ministry allows those to uh, other adults to concentrate and to to uh, to be more um, uh, you know disciplined in how they're listening and um, reverent in how they're taking on God's word. So one of the reasons we do that for sure is, uh, is to uh, recognize the culture, um, apply to it and so forth. Um, but one of the things too, and it's not said here, but one of the things that has been said all, oftentimes, we really believe in, in, in integrating the children into the adult worship as soon as possible. And, and some of you who may be familiar with it in the 80s where many churches uh, established this thing called children's church or 70s and 80s children's church they had a wonderful children's church and a, a, a thriving ministry going in children's church what ended up coming from that however because we had the little um the salty songs and sonnets and whatever else uh, music much of the the music of the church for the adults was lost and then and when these uh, youngsters became adults they were looking to something more. You had this clash within a church, a division within a church where you had uh, lots of arguments over music and, and, and form and, and how worship was done. Do you have um, uh, you know, drum sets up on stage? Do you have electric guitars? Uh, do you have no music at all? Do you sing old hymns? Do you sing um, uh, worship songs or whatever else? Um, all this takes place because you divide the kids out from adult worship. So it's important to, to integrate them into it uh, so they can ap appreciate um, what has been, you know, before. Not that they have to stick with it, but that they can appreciate it. Comments on that? Anybody want to jump in or? Okay. Um, okay, the church. Um, the church must also be invested in training women through a vital women's ministry that is committed and solid teaching application of scriptures, guides as fosters feminine discipleship and develops and trains and equips women to exposit the word and wisely apply biblical truth. Our women are to be taught by other women how to love their husbands and children. So that kind of thing, the older woman teaching the younger woman. The, the goal of women's ministry it is women teaching women 
on women's issue and thus preparing them for honoring their savior in the way they live at home, at church, and in society. Biblical teaching demonstrates our commitment to Christian education. The historic Christian church has always been involved in education since like the Jewish people, we Christians are people of God's book. A book is to be read, studied, and interpreted. This gives instant endorsement for God's people to be dedicated to education. Furthermore, Christianity is not merely a religion, but a worldview, a way of looking at all of life and every subject of learning. There is a Christian view of science, the arts, humanity, history, math, literature, economics, anthropology, athletics, and every other subject. Part of the vision of Hope Bible Church is to be an educating establishment um, to all who will learn. This includes establishing a Christian school for young people, a biblical institute for adults, and a seminary for those training for ministry. One of those three we've accomplished, we've got a biblical institute going on. The second we're kind of partway into with a Christian school. We have Hope Academy, but that's not really a totally a Christian school. It's a homeschool tutorial and it helps assist parents in doing their uh, training of their children. But if we don't have actually a school for some parents who really homeschooling is not going to be a possibility. And there are there are them. They're tell that. And they don't want to to have to send their kids uh, to a uh, a public school, but they have no other choice. So that's something that may be in the future to think about. A seminary for training uh, ministry. We do some training of that already. There has been a seminary um, established in Virginia, um, which uh, I don't know if it's going to continue, but uh, Master Seminary had an annex out there. Um, we have a vision for that in the future, quite frankly. That's why in, in the vision, I tell people all the time, I think I'm sometimes crazy. I look at the, the entire uh, office park that we're in and I say, I don't know if I'll live long enough to see it, but I think that down the road, if Hope Bible Church is faithful and God grows it in a way, we should actually own this entire, entire office park and use it to God's glory. One of the things that would be in there perhaps would be a seminary. Um, a Christian school would be another part of it. Just think of it. You have a you beautiful space there all right in the middle of Howard County in Columbia. and uh, we can really service a lot, really well, well positioned. Our vision for the future is to continue to raise up followers of Christ who will use their full giftedness for the Lord. It would be a great honor to continue to be used of the Lord to affect the next generation for Christ and raise up from among the youth vibrant and serious disciples of Christ. I don't think there can be anything more important right now. Well, yeah, there can be more important. But that's got to be really high on the list of the most important things that we have to do uh, in thinking is what our next generation is, is going to be trained to do and, and so forth and do. Really is. Um, as, as Ronald Reagan says, with freedom is only one generation away from extinction. Um, we, can, we will not lose because we serve a God that's a conquering God. But it's it sometimes I hate to have things lost on my on my watch. You know what I'm saying? It's just, we, have, we have an entrustment here. Okay, so that, that would be an equipping church concept. We also have a church that we I'm going to call an extending church, which we endeavor to be a church that has a significant and growing impact on our region and beyond by witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ, exporting biblical doctrine, planting new churches, and implementing other and impacting other churches with a, a biblical philosophy of ministry. As servants of the kingdom of God, our concern reaches beyond our local church to the health and maturity of the surrounding churches and the worldwide church. In cooperation with other like-minded churches and organizations, we are committed to strengthening the greater body of Christ in global evangelistic ministry that gave uh, that Jesus gave his church. So we see that in a number of ways, um, clearly. Um, 
from HPC from the beginnings uh, sought to find like-minded churches with the same similar theology and philosophy of ministry and cooperate with them in the mission of Christ. Um, in this particular, Tom's thinking about um, when he came here, he joined a group of churches called uh, uh, International uh, uh, Fundamentalist Churches of America. Um, in California, that was a very vibrant group uh, supporting one another. He, he joined it here, hoping he'd get some support as a young church planning pastor, um, found it not to be a very um, a very healthy um, in, in the sense of energy um, group. And he, he provided a lot of energy too. It helped it grow some, but it was not, it was not um, some group of um, mature pastors there to help him and so forth. You do, um, some of you know uh, Joe Bobby from New Jersey. We heard him speak and so forth. This is one of the pastors I think um, that Tom did get a great deal of mentoring and help um, uh, encouragement from as well. He was looking for that kind of joining and cooperation. So <clears throat> the fact that that wasn't there, um, ultimately this is what happened. Um, that's where um, Grace Advanced Mid-Atlantic grew out of, a cooperation of churches, something that um, Tom found like many pastors, uh, they coalesced and they have been growing. Christ established an independent local church um, who must give an account directly to him as the head of the church, but he still expects those churches to propagate the same Christian faith and to work interdependently, especially interdependently, especially in their witness to the world. Romans 16 and Corinthians 16, Timothy 4. In modern times, there are also Christian organizations called, called alongside local churches to aid them in their ministry. We strive to work in harmony with those who hold conservative evangelical, evangelical uh, positional uh, approach. That can be a difficult, not only hard to hear it say, but it can be a difficult thing to do to determine what other kind of organizations outside of churches um, that we can work alongside of, and that takes a lot of discernment. Um, we benefit by cooperating with other churches because they serve as an example to us in areas where their ministries are more mature. We also seek to be a godly influence on them, having been the key instrument to draw together like-minded pastors and churches. The Lord used HBC to form a new fellowship of churches in the Mid-Atlantic region. These churches presently cooperate together in a number of ways, including a joint annual conference, shared events, pastors and wives get-togethers. That's quite an important thing, by the way. We don't think of that as much, but pastors, if being a pastor is kind of a lonely position sometimes. Um, a Bible Institute, a website sharing resources, a pulpit fill, ordination oversight, administrative guidance, and other key teachings. So if, if none of you ever been to an ordination at Hope Bible Church, it's very interesting to see other pastors from around the region also coming and reviewing the men that are being ordained. Um, it's a very helpful thing to keep the church healthy. Our vision for the future is to see this fellowship of churches expand and the cooperation increase. We desire to be able to facilitate and uphold new church plants. We pray the Lord will unite our congregation more closely uh, through joint participation in a variety of ministries. The impact we seek it is not so much uh, social justice, fighting against global warming, saving the animal population, or anything in vogue in the political area. Focusing on those kind of issues is not why, since it is important to affect the real change God's desires in people. The power of God is in the gospel to change lives, and we are a witness, uh, as we witness the gospel to the world, that they may realize their sinful and unsafe position before God, turn away from sin and embrace full faith in the savior of the world, Romans 1. In a day when causes, both political and social, run amok and beckon believers to give each of them attention, 
the church of Jesus must be sharpened by the concerns of their Lord uh, in the New Testament, not the world. That is very tough sometimes. And it doesn't mean we can't be interested in politics, doesn't mean we can't be interested and so forth, but the church itself needs not to be sucked in or brought into these controversies, it needs to stay, uh, stay true to what we need to be doing, which is Jesus' concerns, the Lord's concerns. The church was left on earth to advance the gospel of Jesus, Acts 1. Indeed, this is our number one task in the world and for the world. Our vision is to be committed to local evangelism in any form the Lord makes available to us. We plan to use personal contact, um, special events, worship services, written materials, service projects, and modern forms of communications, including internet, radio, TV, books, and podcasts. We also seek to support local evangelistic work, workers who take the gospel into subgroups of our church cannot readily reach. This would include supporting and participating in campus ministries, hospitals and prison, uh, military organizations, et cetera. It also means that we are committed to starting and supporting evangelical Bible studies and other languages to reach subcultures God has brought from around the world right here in our backyard. And that's an interesting um, thing that Tom has mentioned uh, numerous times in the fact that <clears throat> doing foreign missions or reaching the world, um, we are basically in the Rome of the 20 and 20, 21st and 20th century. Uh, of the world. All roads meet here. People come and cross us. All cultures meet here. And being a church that can reach those people just by being where we are is, is really quite important. God has got us positioned. Commitment to a Christ, a great commission to make disciples of all nations also means we are committed to foreign missions because most of the people in the world, 95% of them, live outside our country. They too by the Lord's command, are to be given a chance to hear Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. <clears throat> our vision to see 10% of our total offering being designated to bring the gospel to the nations by supporting trained, called missionaries, supported pastor training facilities, and other related supportive ministry organizations. Um, to, to be more specific about that, <clears throat> that is a a commitment that has been from the beginning thinking of in general the pattern that um, while we don't have a tithe required of us 10 percent is the suggestion the scripture makes for us personally to the church um, and the thought was within the elders to for hope bible church that a tithe or a 10 percent uh, of our income should be going to um, providing for foreign missions and so forth. At this present time, the church is about seven or eight percent. So it has nearly fulfilled that particular um, uh, desire, which is interesting. Um, okay, let's end it. We also, um, we also have our vision to raise up and send out missionaries from our own congregation to serve the Lord overseas. And we have Stephen and uh, Lisa Reisman, who are our missionaries that we have actually, uh, we're the sponsoring church that was sent out, which is wonderful. But we sponsor other missionaries. And it's interesting, if you were to get into the financials of it, you'd be surprised how much appreciative uh, those missionaries are and how much we are supporting them. A lot of churches support a lot of missionaries. They have a whole large list of missionaries. And their support of missionaries consists about $25 a month which is not a great deal of support. So if you were Stephen and Lisa right now, they're trying to do raising um, money to support their ministry in Togo. They've got to go and talk to a lot of churches and they get $25 here, $25 there and so forth. It takes a lot of that to make it uh, something that supports them really. Hope, um, Hope is, is on regularly giving $1,000 and $1,200 a month uh, to the missionaries we give. So we support our missionaries in a very strong way. 
starting new churches or strengthening weaker ones is also part of our vision. Given that uh, many opportunity churches in our area, our region could use many more solid uh, Bible churches uh, with, ex ex with expositors filling the pulpits and sound doctors filling their classrooms. So HBC was already privileged to start Baltimore Bible Church in 2013. That, those of you who were not here then knowing of that situation, that's an amazing story of God's um, chess playing and how he moved things around and bringing George and Jennifer Lawson uh, to Hope Bible Church to sit under the uh, discipleship of Tom and Alan and others uh, and grow and have a desire to go to um, be well, better, even better trained um, at the Master's Seminary and come back and always having desire to, uh, uh, to reach the inner city uh, of America. And uh, George is fulfilling that goal right now and doing great by God's grace. Our vision is uh, to first establish our pastoral staff at HBC, then as the church grows, and then as the Lord leads, start other churches in needy areas. Through our fellowship of churches, we also support uh, churches going through revitalization. Our church is not to uh, choose between uh, growing, a, growing large or planting more churches, but to let the Lord grow his church in all aspects as he deems appropriate. And one of the things in that particularly that has played out, um, we were considering getting the new building that we're in right now and putting resources towards that. There were some that were making the claims as why don't we just, um, just spawn off new, um, uh, you know, church plants. So we've got a hundred people, boom, send a hundred people there. Each time we get a hundred people and so forth. There is some uh, problems with that from a standpoint of, um, you know, practicality. Um, a strong church is needed, strong foundation for a church is needed to send out uh, and support uh, new churches, planting churches. So the concept that has come up, instead of having say a hundred people, once you get to 200, split, make a hundred two, two churches, is wait till you get a thousand or, 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 or 1500, and then break off a hundred of your members that go and plant a new church, gives them a good support structure to begin and, and have a church that, that will be able to be sustaining in itself. Um, whereas we started this church with four families. Uh, I don't know, there's probably uh, 12 adults um, in the in the whole group. Um, that's That was um, a struggle, okay? But that struggle is what was God was in, so that struggle was going to succeed. But doing it from a rational standpoint of planting churches, it would be wise to have a, a, a large enough um, uh, critical mass so that a church can have a reasonable um, uh, ability to be su successful in where it's planted. Starting new churches or strengthening weaker ones is also part of our vision, given the many compromises compromising churches in our area, our region could use many more biblical churches with ex sisters filling the pulpits and sound doctrine filling the classrooms. HVC is already privileged, as I said, to the uh, Baltimore Bible Church. Our vision is to first establish our pastoral staff, then as the church grows and as the uh, Lord leads, start other churches in needy areas. Through our fellowship of churches, we also support churches going through, right? I guess, again, I've done that, I'm reading a lot of again, I'm sorry, I do it right here. I am repeating myself. Our vision is not to choose between growing large or planting more churches, but to let the Lord grow his church in all aspects as he deems appropriate. All right. Trying to minister effectively in a postmodern world requires that we position our outreach before the world wisely. The modern liberal mindset is typically adverse to the ideal of evangelism and religious conversation. Any of you, any of you ever experienced that in this, in this world um, and, and how postmodernism is, is affected it? What, what would be, by the way, a definition of postmodernism? How would that, how would anybody define that? 
Uh, I think probably the summary statement was uh, uh, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Right. So, so how would that affect um, the, the, the evangelism, uh, basically going uh, out? Don't impose your truth on my truth. Yeah. And that's, and our culture has subscribed to that a lot. So you get a lot of pushback and people think not listening to the message, you're not reaching them in the culture by, by using it, that method um, that was worked before postmodernism became popular. Okay. So um, uh, people of other religions often become defensive if they think somebody's trying to convert them to Christianity. While not being shy of seeking conversions, we present our gospel work to local outreach as education. When we pass out tracts, witness our neighbors and coworkers, or proclaim the gospel on Sundays and other events, we are teaching them God's word and educating them in things divine, including how to uh, relate to God, why the Bible is uh, reliable, and why Christ must be the only way to the Father. Since education is a word and concept the world appreciates and readily embraces, we use, uh, we use with unbelievers it to explain our outreach to ministries and company, uh, our company accomplishing. Um, one of the things I, I want to say is, is that in our culture, though people, Ron, as you say, want to say your truth, my truth kind of thing, leave me alone. Um, we are a culture that is always looking at information age, right? So education seems to be a, a, a um, an open avenue to reaching people. They want to learn something. They want to be in the know. They don't want to be missing out, okay? At least, at least it has been that way. Motivated by, by Christ, truth, and love, we also aim uh, to start counseling center, which we have done now, just beginning, uh, that will be able to evangelize uh, and aid unbelievers in our community. Counseling is a wide open door. The Lord has given the modern church to reach hurting households. You can definitely see that uh, in the, the way our culture goes with all the people wanting to have self-help and counseling and whatever. Training in evangelism um, helps to undergird our evangelism initiatives and vision. We seek to train our people how to bring up spiritual issues and conversations and then present them in a cogent gospel presentation. We also urge congregation um, to use church uh, invitations as a way to evangelize. Often visitors will first come to a church event like the women's breakfast or youth retreat before they visit a Sunday. We urge our people to look for those kinds of opportunities. Our vision is to have a pastor of missions and evangelism and other men gifted in evangelism train the congregation both in the proclamation of faith evangelism and the defense of their faith apologetics in a variety of venues. And I hope to be doing a class in spring on apologetics, which will um, be, I think, uh, very helpful to some that would kind of want some uh, kind of exemplification of how do you how do you do it in this world? Um, and how do you stay true to the gospel? Uh, so uh, an expectant church is also uh, what we endeavor to be. We endeavor to maintain a healthy anticipation that God will continue to work through our church as we take further steps of faith, pray earnestly, rely on the Holy Spirit, and keep our hope fixed on Jesus, soon appearance in the sky. From our inception, we have been a faith venture. We have believed the entire Christian mission advances only by faith in which God chooses to accomplish the impossible through ordinary believers with his extraordinary strength. We choose not to place limits on what God can do through his chosen vessels, but to venture forward by well-informed faith in full, uh, fully capable and amazing God. So this is one section that I think often gets I guess reduced as the church grows. Um, 
sometimes we start relying on our own abilities and our savings and whatever else it might be. So an expectant church, Hope Bible Church from its inception has been a faith venture, and that is quite true. Um, we talked about that earlier. That means we venture forward without adequate earthly resources, trusting that God would supply the needs for his church if we first obey, rather than waiting for money to be money uh, for the monies and support to come. From church planning research, we read statistics about the difficulty of starting churches. Some 50% of all church plants fail due to a number of factors, like the support um, is one of them. Unlike uh, many churches, church plants, we have no mother church uh, or denomination backing us. So one of the things, you know, you teach church planning and so forth that they'd like to do to be good is make sure you have some backing. And that was one of Tom's questions when he asked uh, uh, his professor, how many people do you need to plant a church? Because he was thinking, you know, at least 10 families or something, at least that. And he was told, you got you, that's it, and plant a church. That was a pastor of faith that is very, very important in, in Tom's development and also for Bible churches. We also had no experience in planting successful churches. Furthermore, we were small in number and we were attempting to launch a kind of church that no one else was accomplishing in the target area, as far as we knew. Add to the fact that the Maryland area is one of the most expensive areas in the country with a, a transient population and quite liberal mindset, and you have the recipe for a likely church failure. But with hardly any resources, except for the love of the Lord, faith in the word, preserving, uh, persevering in prayer, and the commitment to each other, we launched forward because we believed our God was able to accomplish more than we could think or ask, Ephesians 3. So that basically is a synopsis of it happened. Steps of faith did not stop after the church was launched. Each major step in the church history also required faith. When visitors did not come in response to outreaches, and they didn't, we persisted in faith. When the city of Laura ousted us from our original meeting place without warning and with little rationale, we prayed and God supplied the home of the Zenders, one of the founding members, at which to meet for three Sundays. A little word on that for you who have not experienced that. Um, Saturday evening late, Tom was at my house. Uh, we were meeting in a, uh, a facility across from the train station in Laurel. Um, it wasn't a perfect church facility, but it was a roof and it was actually air conditioned for our worship and heated, um, not for our second hour. Our second hour didn't have those things, but um, first hour did. Um, and as Tom left, went home, he could have gone home in several ways. He said he just I told Sue he'd like to go past the church. It was late at night. It was down by the railroad tracks. There was a lot of um, alcoholics and bums by the railroad station. It was not a very safe place, but he drove past and he saw some strange things looking in the window. He couldn't recognize what it was. And it was a sign posted by Laurel uh, that Friday that uh, the building was unsafe and should not be occupied. And um, the city of Laurel posted it. We could not raise up anybody. The city of Laurel was closed down on Saturday. We were thinking all of our books were in there. We were thinking for our, our song books and so forth, chairs, what are we gonna do? We don't even have anything, our Bibles. Um, you know, can we, can we even enter the building? Finally got a hold of the man who actually was in charge of that. He was, uh, had took the weekend off, goes, went to Ocean City, was on the beach. I remember he, uh, Alan and Tom talking to him on the beach and him saying, well, that's okay. You go ahead and meet in there anyhow, and and, and uh, you know we'll settle it later and so forth. Is well, can we get that in writing? Oh no, I can't put that in writing. But go ahead, don't worry about it. And and uh, Alan and Tom saying, no, we're not going to go ahead and just even the appearance of of breaking the rules and so forth without having it written. We're not going to do that. So we were without a place to meet. There was Saturday, twelve o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon, and we had to decide. We decided that I had a fairly decent sized concrete pool deck and it um, was only other opportunity. I had a tent, um, a 20 by 20 tent that we put up in case we had to do it. And we were small enough that most people could fit under it, not all. Um, and so we set it up 
and we had church that Sunday morning on my 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 pool deck. The next day, I got on the phone looking for facilities for us to meet. Um, we ended up uh, finding a facility, much to my amazement, a Fulton Elementary, which is what we had hoped to have to begin with. And um, three weeks later, we were in that. But each successive Sunday, we were on my pool deck for three Sundays. But in between those Sundays, we had a monstrous tropical storm two Sundays, uh, two weeks in a row, both dumping about seven and a half inches of rain throughout the thing. One of them knocked all the power out, so there was no power on Sunday morning. I have, um, I'm on well water, um, and electricity pumps the well, didn't have the well. So if somebody needed to use the facilities, the toilet, uh, there was no water to flush the toilets. So people at church, would I provided a five gallon bucket, they would dip water out of the pool, they'd take it to the toilet, and that's the way they flush the toilet. Once you know how Hope Bible Church began. <laughs> it's, really, it's a very, very funny story as we do now, but it was an amazing provision of God's grace. Though it rained like, uh, like Noah's Ark during the week, and we had no electricity, Sunday mornings in October were absolutely gorgeous. There were azure blue skies, the temperature was 71, 72 degrees. It was actually perfect weather. God gave us for every one of those things. The third, the fourth Sunday, we were in a new facility at, at um, um, Walton Elementary, which we were there for 10 years. And they rolled the red carpet out for us and we grew in there and it grew for us in there. An amazing situation of God's provision. Just, just one of the things that God went on. Um, God supplied Fulton Elementary, as he says here and the leaks home for the needs for their 10 years. Still, growth was slow, resources small, though morale was not always strong. We, that, that was what I said, we, uh, we had the joy of the Lord. Um, we um, could not see with our eyes how we would gain the proper leadership for the church, an adequate long-term facility, a start of, of many needed ministries. However, we tried never to make decisions based on the available resources alone, but on what we needed to accomplish. That was what it's meant to be a faith venture. And this is where definitely Tom is pouring his heart out here. That's the kind of things he went through. There were times of, is this really what you want me to do, Lord? And always checking and so forth. After years, the Lord supplied us Oakland Mills rental facility and then the annex building as we grew in number. During that time, we also saw an opportunity to plant Baltimore Bible Church and pull some of our resources and people away from ourselves to aid them, which also caused the church to have some difficulty and continue on and, and, and such because those resources are, you know, were, were helpful in, in making us feel more comfortable. On paper, this may have looked like an unwise decision since our church still had so many needs, but it has been blessed by the Lord to bear fruit in Baltimore City to this day. In time too, the Lord had enough people to stay for a longer time in HBC. Getting trained, these are the people that went to Baltimore Bible, getting trained and uh, filling out many of our ministries, including our deacon and elder boards. Um, this movement forward by faith is not presumptuous. And this is important to factor about thinking about faith. Since we're not asking God to do our will, Rather, we stepped out on faith, taking the risk because we knew it was God's will to do this good work. Some think that venturing forward by faith is at odds with wisdom. And you got the bean counters in there all the time thinking, we have this. We argue we must not take a step until the resources, they argue that, they, that we not, they should not take a step until the resources are in hand. This is not pleasing to the Lord. It is the highest expression of wisdom to trust God to do what he said he would do as we trust him to do it. Only when we trust God to do what we cannot yet do are we living by faith. Only faith decisions honor the God who is so faithful to his promise and so resourceful that doubting him is dishonor to his name. So only faith decisions honor him, doubting is dishonoring him. Um, and I think a lot as well, I remember in the, the building fund situation, I remember you, Ann, 
talking about uh, your your parents' church that you were part of and how they raised money um, just by saying to the, the people we needed to have the money to do this and so forth, and people brought forth a great deal of money. Hope Bible Church simply did the same. Um, uh, in whatever was needed, God provided. And it was a great act of, of blessing to everyone, those that, that provided the, and those that uh, saw that being provided. This act of faith is the product of lives impacted by the Spirit of God using his written word to mold our hearts and minds. The motivation to continue walking forward and trusting God for the next phase of the church's development was only possible because of a constant, thorough exposure to the word of God. And we're still walking forward. We, we will continue to pray that each step of faith will bring glory to God. A church which ceases to make steps of faith has taken the first steps towards ceasing to be. I think that's a motto that ought to be put someplace, to be honest with you. A church that ceases to make steps of faith has taken the first steps towards ceasing to be. And that it's it's really simple to do. And it's not, it's always done logically, you know. You know, we really don't have the resources to do that. It's a great idea, but we you know. We need to know what the Lord wants and we need to we need to move to step out on faith. <clears throat> we rely on the truth of scripture. <clears throat> Let's see how I'm doing with time here. Oh, time, time. We are running out of time. Oh. <clears throat> we rely on the truth of scripture, but also on the power of prayer. Philippians and Philemon. Um, even though we are limited and only weak, God is not limited. Luke, that we, that is uh, why prayer is essential to the work of the church ministry. For future, we continue to be committed to individual prayer, small group prayer, corporate prayer times of prayer, because we think we will, uh, uh, that we think we will make any real spiritual progress apart from prayer is preposterous. And that's why we are praying church. And it really is really the most powerful weapon and resource we have. Our consistent commitment to prayer is a reminder to all of our consistent reliance on God. And what better place to be relying on than God? What else would you want to be relying on? Prayer is the atmosphere in which the Lord works his gracious will in Ephesians. Okay, um, we will have to pick up on Excellent Church next time and go through the marks of a, of a, um, a healthy church um, next week. So we'll have to close at this point. Um, and I want to leave at least a couple minutes for any comments or um, any uh, explanations on what we've done, talked about. Any questions you want to have answered for next time through? I have one question. Yeah, well. All the way back to senior pastor. Yeah. And um, I guess I guess as I think as I think through what what I know what little bit I know of scripture, I don't know that I mean you, you brought up the example of James you know being um, you know possibly senior pastor mm -hmm. and um, Peter being a senior pastor, but I don't know that as I think I don't know that there is kind of like a mandate or an, an instruction or precept. Mm -hmm. Hmm. where a senior pastor is kind of mandated. The only place that I could see in scripture where maybe, you know, other, outside of James and Paul, uh, there's a senior pastor is where <clears throat> uh, Timothy was left in Crete to, you know, to kind of appoint uh, elders and, and do those things basically kind of in set the direction as a senior pastor is, is, would, would we say that is kind of the, the flow of, you know, the kind of the position of senior pastor? Uh, really, there was a, a whole lesson that we, we worked on when we talked about elder role and the, the role of senior pastor. And there's a number of scripture that Tom has, uh, which supports that. That one you're bringing up is one as, as well. Um, the, the real concept is, is organizationally, that any organization has somebody who is going to end up being in charge of leading, um, whether it's just uh, facilitating and leading a meeting and so forth, 
Um, but when it comes to a church with vision and the vision that the church has, that there needs to be a collection of people who get behind th that singular vision or else you have basically floundering. Um, and, and that's where you saw with um, where, where James rose to that position in, in, um, in, in Jerusalem. Um, he, he, they, they rallied around him as a person to do. You saw the same thing if you would if you'd look to the founding of this country, um, uh, the, uh, the Constitutional Convention, and so forth, the people that, that rose to a leader, there was no one saying, okay, you are our leader and following it. But ultimately, somebody does, because of their giftedness, because of the way God's set it up, uh, uh, puts it that way. In our case, it has been kind of simple um, for Hope Bible Church, as Tom being a founding pastor, the only pastor until he um, ordained uh, Alan, um, that there basically is a senior pastor, all pastors, right? But we believe also in a plurality for, for the many reasons that we talked about as well. When you get that plurality, everyone on there is, is as valuable and as, as weighty as anybody else, but each have their own area of giftedness and, and so forth. You, if somebody is um, terrifically um, uh, gifted in real estate, for instance, and understanding real estate, and he's on the elder board, the, the other elders who don't know anything about that or finance, they're, they're going to look to him for some from guidance and so forth. So that portion, they end up being the, the senior pastor. And by definition, um, having a, um, a staff pastor, in our case, Tom being the only one for so long, um, everything kind of goes through that as far as a, as a, as a command center. And they act in, in knowing more about the church. They, they just, the connections are there and so forth. So there's lots of reasons we could look to, um, next week. I'll bring them back up again uh, to answer that question because time's out. But um, there's there's reason for seeing your pastor in scripture as, as shown as as uh, demonstrated the New Testament church, but also just uh, just logically um, deduced from from scripture. So it goes on. I'll, I'll I'll answer that further, Willie. Next week I'll promise to bring that up first, if you will. Okay.